Hey, I am Liza Gross, Vice President of Practice Change for the Solutions Journalism Network in the United States. Thank you very much for joining me today to learn about Solutions Collaboratives, our response to the increasing challenge posed by the expanding news desert in our communities in the United States. Thank you very much also for the organizers of this wonderful event that will help us think about the future of journalism and how we move forward. I will now share my slides to begin outlining the magnitude and scope of the expanding news desert that we are facing in the United States and its impact on communities and by extension on democracy. I thought I'd start by giving you some details about the scope and the magnitude of the news desert challenge that we are facing in the United States. For that, I am going to be using the gold standard of research on this topic. It's the local, the expanding news desert project by Professor Penny Abernathy at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. This is brand new information. This is her fourth report on the expanding news deserts. And as you can see, it came out just a few months ago. Since 2004, the United States has lost one fourth of its newspapers, including 70 dailies and more than 2000 weeklies and non-dailies. Today, the United States has 6,700 papers down from 9,000 just 15 years ago, including dailies, non-dailies, and weeklies. More than 100 papers, additionally, including at least a dozen of the daily newspapers that were printed and distributed in 2004, are now online-only sites. More than 200 of our nation's 3,143 counties and equivalents currently have no newspaper and no alternative source of credible and comprehensive information serving the community. COVID has only accelerated this decline and increased the magnitude of the challenge. At least 30 newspapers have closed or merged in April and May of this year. Dozens of newspapers have switched to online only and thousands of journalists at legacy and digital news operations have been either furloughed or laid off entirely. This visualization shows us very clearly the dramatic decline in the number of newspapers in our country. The one on the left shows the amount of newspapers existing in 2004. The one on the right shows us the current panorama. This other visualization shows us what does our local news ecosystem look like at the moment. If we look at our national newspapers, and that would be the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and USA Today, there's only three of them serving the entire country. Then you have your metro and regional papers, um, powerhouses about 15 years ago, but not so much today. These would be the LA Times, the Miami Herald, the Newark Star Ledger, and the Cleveland Plain Dealer, for example. And then you see a whole host at the bottom of the pyramid of community newspapers serving the needs, the informational needs of uh, communities. These include ethnic newspapers, small and mid-sized daily, and your weeklies. So this dramatic reduction in the number of news outlets in the country has also led to a dramatic reduction in the number of news professionals. Over the past decade, the number of newspaper journalists has fallen from 71,000 to 35,000. Now, of course, some of these have migrated to digital startups or to TV stations. However, the overall loss in the workforce is more than 24,000. This visualization show, shows in a very dramatic fashion 
the decline of total US newsroom employment from 2004 to 2019. But what is the impact of this changing landscape and of these dwindling numbers of local newspapers serving their communities? Well, number one, of course, the decline, or in some cases, the outright loss of content to address critical community information needs. Many of these smaller newspapers are now part of larger chains. There has been huge consolidation in the industry. So the editorial and business decisions are not made at the newspaper level. They are made by corporate headquarters that in many cases are far away geographically from the newspapers they own. The second impact, and we will see this evolving more over time, is the exacerbation of the news divide. It's only common sense, but it is happening. Wealthy communities, of course, can afford to underwrite or support local news outlets more easily than communities that are less affluent. So those communities have much more difficulty accessing news and information that they can use. And of course, there's the persistent uncertainty around the long-term financial model. We know that the newspaper model has collapsed and also now there's indications that the traditional television uh, model is also precarious. We also know that digital startups are not easily achieving financial sustainability. So this adds to the concerns of the long-term future of uh, local media ecosystems. What has Solutions Journalism Network done to address this? This is our response to address the news desert crisis by strengthening local media ecosystems. And I reiterate, this is to address local media ecosystems. Let me first back up a little bit and tell you what are the two drivers of our response? One is, of course, solutions journalism. We are the Solutions Journalism Network, and our mission is to spread the adoption of the technique of solutions journalism, which, as you can see here, is rigorous, evidence-based reporting on responses to social problems. And then the other vector is news collaboratives. There are plenty, many, many models for collaboration. Collaboration now is in fashion. So news organizations are rushing to set up content exchange agreements or joint reporting agreements. Our collaboratives are a little bit more involved. They take those elements and they add more to them. So for us, a collaborative is a formal agreement between a group of news organizations and other entities very important, other entities that somehow are commu strong community actors, such as libraries, universities, or research centers, working together with a long-term strategy for the purpose of better informing and engaging their communities. We do this through our local media project initiative. This is a five-year initiative we are now in year two and a half. We're approaching our third year mark and we're operating at this intersection, the intersection of solutions journalism and news collaboratives. This initiative, by the way, is funded by the Knight Foundation. This initiative currently includes nine active collaboratives throughout the United States, seven stewarded by us alone and two in partnership with the local media association. Our first experiment was Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. 15 news organizations got together in Philadelphia to look at the issue of reentry, reentry post incarceration. The city of Philadelphia had a significant challenge with incarcerated citizens, and then the challenge of having them reinsert themselves in uh, the community after completing their sentences. For a year and a half, the collaborative worked on this issue and changed the conversation around reentry. 
Now that collaborative is a full-fledged nonprofit organization, and it has jumped from 15 original members to now 24. Still going strong, still very um, focused on maintaining sustainability with a sound business model, and have been quite successful in terms of uh, leveraging uh, philanthropic support within the city of Philadelphia. Our next experiment was New Hampshire, which allowed us to prove that the intersection of news collaboratives and solutions journalism also works in a rural environment. There, um, a few, about a dozen news organizations started a collaborative that they called the Granite State News Collaborative. That's the name that uh, New Hampshire is known by. And now that number has swelled to over 15. They also have a university participating as a partner and have made inroads in reaching out to communities that have not been traditional news consumers. Next, we went to Charlotte. Charlotte was looking at affordable housing. Charlotte has been experiencing a boom, a financial boom, that of course is not supporting every segment of the Charlotte population equally. So they wanted to look at the issues caused by uh, this increasing wealth uh, and the impact on affordable housing for uh, all residents of Charlotte. That collaborative again was started in 2019, still going strong and like New Hampshire, looking at developing at the moment their business model for long-term sustainability. And this is what our initiative looks like at the moment. All of the yellow stars are emerging collaboratives. They were all started six months ago or um, less or more recently. Uh, but they are all focused on the same thing. They all have between a dozen and 18 members. They all are focused on a problem or a challenge that is of significant meaning to the community that they are operating in. And they are all focused on changing the conversation around this. And as you see, we have a smattering of um, states that are uh, more populated, more densely populated, like you would say Ohio and less densely populated and with a significant rural population like um, Wichita and um, Kansas and Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, Tulsa. By the way, Oklahoma City, Tulsa is a collaboration of those two cities which are located about half an hour uh, from each other. So this is what we insist on in terms of um, expectations for our collaboratives when we are getting ready to launch them in a, um, a given community or when a group of news organizations come to us and say, how can we launch a solutions-based collaborative? Well, of course, participants must embrace solutions journalism. That is the key. Reporting on solutions in addition to identifying and describing the problems. Agree upon one well-defined topic for a certain length of time to make sure you're changing the conversation around that topic, to make sure that you can show how the community is evolving regarding this issue. As I mentioned in Philadelphia, they stayed with reentry for over a year and a half. They produced over 200 pieces, podcasts, straight news stories, digital um, broadcast segments, uh, multi-platform uh, initiatives, but over 200 pieces. Not all of them, of course, were solutions journalism strictly, but the whole thrust of the coverage was a solutions-oriented coverage. You need to set clear expectations for participation. We have seen collaboratives fail because all of the difficult conversations are not had up front. Everybody thinks, oh, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. We'll solve that problem when it arises. No, what we recommend is have all your difficult conversations ahead of time. How are you going to work together? Do you have any built-in biases regarding other participants of the collaboratives? You need to air all this out. Otherwise, it will prove an insurmountable challenge once you launch. Important also, 
to design clear processes and protocols for how you're going to be working, who is going to do what, how are you going to set up your editorial calendar, how are you going to coordinate joint reporting. We also suggest that if you really successfully want to address the informational needs of your community, you must have representation that is reflective of the makeup of your community. When we talk about news deserts, of course, Penny Abernathy, our biggest authority on uh, news deserts, has focused on uh, newspapers and um, mostly in rural and uh, areas that are not that densely populated. But you could also make an argument that in very densely populated areas in the United States, cities like Philadelphia, Charlotte, Cleveland, there has always been some type of news desert in the sense that some communities never saw their informational needs addressed by the traditional media. In fact, they saw misrepresentation, mischaracterization, and stereotypical information about them. So it is crucial to ensure diversity of representation. What does your community look like? That's what your collaborative should look like. Develop an impact and metric strategy from the very beginning. What are you trying to achieve? How are you going to change this conversation? And how are you going to know that you have changed this conversation? And build a business strategy for long-term sustainability. This is our response. One response to the increasing uh, news desert challenge that we're facing. We want to create a business model that will ensure that these hubs, these collaborative hubs, can live for the long term. No margin, no mission. So important to figure out how you will get the margin. This is the most crucial part for journalists that want to enter a collaborative because it doesn't have to do with anything external to them. It has to do with something internal to us as journalists. And it means that when you enter the model of collaborative we propose, you have to be willing to undergo a radical transformation on how you view your role. You must be willing to let go of traditional paradigms with which we have operated for many, many years, perhaps through our entire career. We need to learn to treat our audiences, not as sources or subjects, but as interlocutors in an ongoing dialogue. They are not objects to be covered. They are interlocutors in a dialogue. Believing that other news organizations can be partners, not only rivals. Fortunately, we have seen in all our collaboratives, news organizations come together and air out any built-in biases that they could have had about other partners, move forward successfully, and understand that on some things, particularly on challenges for a community, collaboration is the key, not competition. And moving away, of course, from the mindset that the only real journalism is oppositional journalism or what we in the United States call gotcha journalism. There is a place for solutions journalism. There is a place, of course, for oppositional journalism. But we need to flex that muscle of solutions journalism. We need to look at the complexity of issues. We need to look at what's working. And we need to bring that information to the community we serve so they can move forward more productively as they solve the challenges that they are facing. So here I would like to share with you some of the highlights of our results to date. We know, of course, that collaboratives have successfully addressed the first challenge posed by our increasing news testers. They have successfully produced original local content on a topic of fundamental interest for the community. They have strengthened connection with audiences through a variety of activities, uh, focus groups, town halls, film festivals, even hackathons. They have also stimulated, uh, the collaborative settings has stimulated innovation and knowledge sharing. Uh, I'll give two examples, asset mapping. A lot of our collaboratives are now going through the process of asset mapping, which allows them to know 
what is the value added that each news organization is bringing to the collaborative. This was first tested in our collaborative in Ohio, Northeast, uh, Northeast Ohio Collaborative, and now is being used widely by our other collaboratives. And um, to some such creative things as a comic book on the pandemic, Charlotte, has produced a comic book on the pandemic, which of course it will share with the other collaboratives. Fundraising ability, again, in the search of that sustainable business model, we know that philanthropy, particularly place-based philanthropy in the United States will have a very important role to play moving forward. It's not the only revenue stream, but it will be an important revenue stream. And then of course, there are other revenue streams to be explored, monetizing events, monetizing the data, not only for journalistic purposes, data can also be used to generate reports, to generate other types of products uh, that could be of use to um, some individuals and could be, uh, or organizations that could be monetized. Collaboratives make a very efficient use of resources by leveraging complementary assets. So if the radio station is very good at podcasts, and the newspaper is very good at uh, infographics, then there is no need for the newspaper to go into the podcast and the radio station to go into infographics. They can produce something that they can all share. That's another way of increasing your margin. Of course, you need to have revenue, but you can also control your expenses and be more efficient. And collaboratives have proven that. And of course, they have made inroads into new audience segments. Many of the participants in collaboratives have uh, expressed uh, openly the idea that they are uh, all about to join the collaborative because they want to reach segments of the community that they are unable to reach or they have been unable to reach. Uh, all collaboratives, for example, or many of our collaboratives are now generating material in uh, content in Spanish, particularly during the COVID crisis and have made successful inroads in that community as a trusted source of relevant information. So how does it work in practice? I just gave you some general overview of some of the successes that have been achieved by collaboratives, some of the objectives that they have met. But I would like to share with you a brief case study. Uh, the uh, three news collaboratives are most established ones, Philadelphia, Charlotte, and New Hampshire. How did they tackle the COVID-19 crisis with an eye towards what's working? It was very difficult to find instances of what was working in the first days or in the first months of the pandemic. And it was also difficult to respond efficiently to the barrage of information that was circulating at a time when the uh, communities or the population was so fearful that mm, this information or fake news or uh, uh, some sources of information were not uh, to be trusted. So for the collaboratives, it was very, very easy to switch to uh, the COVID mode, as we call it, because they already had the infrastructure in place. They, there was trust among them. There were processes in there that they could rely on. So they were working on one topic, but given the urgency of the pandemic, they were able to say immediately, let's switch to COVID-19. Then we can return to the topic we were um, looking at before the pandemic. But it's imperative now that we coordinate and we provide our communities with the coverage they will need and they can trust. So what did they do in New Hampshire? And here is the current number of partners of the New Hampshire Collaborative 18. So in the first three weeks, they cross-published nearly 100 stories. Not all of them, again, were solutions-oriented, but many of them were. And the whole thrust of the coverage was what can be done, who is doing it better, who is having success, shared story ideas for better coordination, built an audience survey to gather story ideas from the community and follow up on those leads, use their common budget to cover gaps in coverage with freelancers. In other words, uh, the collaborative is operating currently with a common pot of money and they allocated some of that money to hire freelancers that could cover whatever gaps in coverage they had. 
They increase their Twitter reach from 350 to 441. That doesn't sound uh, like uh, an extraordinary number, but it is. It is for New Hampshire. And of course, they launched uh, Spanish language content. What did Charlotte do? Charlotte is our most petite collaborative. It has only nine partners, but have they have built an incredible synergy among them. Within a week, they had organized two virtual town hall meetings, one in English and one in Spanish, total attendance 90, promoted through targeted emails and social media posts, their focus on COVID and the town hall meetings, and placed a focus on informing particularly the most vulnerable segments of the community. In this case, in the case of Charlotte, it meant certain sectors of the ethnic communities, elderly African-Americans, elderly Hispanics. They also translated content into Spanish and hired an intern to produce content in English and Spanish simultaneously. Remember, this information that I am relaying to you now was all in the first month or two uh, of the pandemic. Since then, of course, they have done much, much more. And Philadelphia, with 24 partners, immediately got into gear, shared story ideas, created a Slack channel to better coordinate their COVID coverage, translated over 70 stories into Spanish in the first month to address the needs of the Spanish speaking community, created a common site to field questions from the community. This site was also embedded in the individual sites uh, of the partners through AMP technology. They scheduled community listening sessions online, those are still going, and this joint effort attracted the attention of local philanthropy and they were able to raise $1 million, or so they were able to get a $1 million grant to continue their work. It was so impressive that it attracted the uh, attention of local philanthropy. So here are some qualitative um, responses from the journalists themselves and from the project managers and other uh, folks that participate in our collaboratives. This is Steve Leon from the Concord Monitor in New Hampshire. This group is pulling together the New Hampshire journalism community in a way I never thought was possible. This is music to our ears because of course our goal is to transform the local media ecosystem, to create that culture shift that will enable them to move forward more productively. This is Aubrey Nagel, the project editor from Resolve Philadelphia. Resolve Philly is the current name of the Philadelphia Collaborative once they constituted themselves into a nonprofit. So when COVID-19 began to spread, it quickly became clear that the coordination of the local newsrooms would be more important than ever, and that the existing collaborative spirit and infrastructure would be irreplaceable assets for Philly. You cannot invent or manufacture collaborative spirit and infrastructure in two days. The fact that these existed thanks to the existence of the collaborative made it possible for them to respond so efficiently to the informational needs of the Philly community. And this is Andre Nata. Andre has since moved on, but at the time he was the editor of Broke in Philly, which is the editorial portion of Resolve Philly. In the midst of a breaking news event, most news organizations will revert to the need to get information out first, above all else, oh, that misunderstood sense of competition. It's been great to see our partners find ways to leverage each other's resources to make sure that they are sharing useful news and information for Philadelphians. So how are we supporting the community? What is our role as journalists? What are we bringing to our community that will help them in this time of crisis? So looking ahead for our local media project, our deliverable, our hard deliverable for the Knight Foundation is to establish 15 of these solutions news collaboratives, at least 15. We think we're going to exceed that number, but at least 15 by 2023 in the United States, the year when uh, the grant will finish. But our goals, our broader goals for these collaboratives are to reimagine the role of the journalist by promoting a cultural shift 
through solutions journalism, which is not only it starts as a journalistic technique, but then it allows you to see a very, very different panorama and very, very different options for you as a journalist. Restore journalism conversation keeping tradition. We have lost that. We are so focused on fact gathering and giving the information to our uh, readers or listeners or viewers, and we have forgotten the conversation keeping tradition of journalism. So collaboratives do very, very well at restoring that conversation keeping tradition. And of course, contribute a viable business model based on collaboratives, on solutions collaboratives, to strengthen the local media ecosystems and to be a satisfactory one, satisfactory response. I am sure we will need an array of responses to deal successfully with the expanding news deserts. But here, uh, Solutions Collaboratives, we feel very strongly that this is one solid response that we can offer. Thank you so very much for taking the time to listen and get some details and learn something about our news collaboratives and uh, the collaboratives in the United States that are focused on changing their local media ecosystems. If you want to learn more, please, here is my email. Do not hesitate to get in touch with me, Lisa at solutionsjournalism.org. And if you want to go to our website, www.solutionsjournalism.org. You can go to our virtual lab and you will find there a number of resources that can tell you how to get a collaborative started, how to think about a solutions collaborative, how to decide whether it's right for you in your particular local media ecosystem. Again, thanks for joining me. Thank you again to the organizers of this event. This is Lisa Gross from Solutions Journalism Network. Good day.